really excited to be here today to um, talk to you guys about this topic because when me and my co-author started with this topic, it was for people like you, or with people like you in mind, uh, the kind of people that are willing to innovate, that are, aren't willing to be complacent with the things that are broken around them, and that are willing to break a little bit of, you know, a few rules to get things to be better. Um, I started with this whole project uh, some years ago when a friend of mine got his dream job and the trials and tribulations that he had led me to understand that work is broken. And there's a variety of reasons that, that I think this is so. Um, and the first of them uh, is that are the tools that we have now really suck. Uh, if you think about it, if you're in a large company or in a bureau big bureaucracy, or even if you're working in a small company, there's probably some tools you have that aren't very good. Um, my favorite example of this is IE6, Internet Explorer 6. You remember, all, you remember that, the web browser? They built it back in 2001. It's now a classic example in uh, computer science courses of what bad software looks like. Um, it's full of bugs, it's, uh, it crashes all the time, and it's got enormous security holes. So if you're trying to get people's credit card numbers, IE6 is the thing to use. Um, strangely enough, IE6 is also the second most popular browser in the world today. Thank you the corporate world, right? Um, now this is odd, but if you think about it, it makes a little bit of sense. A recent survey that was done showed that 58% of employees said that their number one criteria in choosing software um, was ease of use. But if you interview their bosses, the managers, the people that actually buy the software, they almost universally said that their most important thing was price. So it's no great surprise that we're getting the tools uh, that our managers want us to have and that they aren't as good as the tools that we choose ourselves. One of my favorite examples of this uh, was from a woman that we interviewed who works at home. She's a work-at-home mom. And her job was to transcribe interviews with customers and in meetings and whatnot and produce color-coded reports. And she was doing this job for a while and eventually her printer broke, so she went in and filled out the TPS report or whatever garbage form it is that they needed to, to fill out to get a new printer. And they did eventually send it to her and she opened it up and it was a black and white printer, which was a bit of a problem because her job was to produce color-coded reports. So she contacted the, the tech department or wherever it was and said, okay, well, look, you know, I appreciate you got me a printer, but it's the wrong one. I need a color printer. And they said, well, company policy now is that everyone uses black and white printers. And she said, that's great. Appreciate it. Good. Thanks very much. But I have to produce color-coded reports. So can you please send me a color printer? And they sent her the exact same email back saying that company policy was now to only use black and white printers. So what she had to do is go down to the store, buy a bunch of highlighters, and hand highlight every single line in all of her reports, which, as you can imagine, did not make her tremendously much more efficient. Uh, in fact, she ended up to make it made her take something like 18 times longer to do every single task that she had to do. And eventually, of course, she quit, which is what any of us would do, because that's nonsense. Top-down bureaucracy, the kind of large-scale organizational structure that we see in large companies today, is built to be inflexible. Uh, the world is moving very quickly these days, as you may have noticed, and if you can't change quickly in response to it, you get stuff like black and white printers given to people pr to produce color reports. Um, my favorite example of this comes from Brent Corker, a professor at the University of Melbourne, who did a study that shows that employees with unfettered access to the internet ha are actually 9% more efficient than those that have nanny software. You know, nanny software is the kind of software that keeps you from going to, to forbidden websites or using unsanctioned software. Uh, so it turns out that if your company is spending lots of money to make sure that you're being as efficient as possible, they actually make you 10% less. So it's no great surprise that people are breaking the rules, right? Forrester Research recently discovered that uh, one third of all employees in the United States are using software that they're not supposed to in their jobs. This is uh, no, no huge shock. Well, but the good news about all this is that we can fix it. So bringing this back to my friend uh, with, the, uh, with the new job, uh, he found that the expensing system was really, really bad. In fact, if he bought a pack of gum or if he bought a five-course meal for a client, he had to fill out the same 60-field form. So, you know, check boxes and text fields and drop-down menus and whatnot. And after he'd been doing this for a while, he found that he was losing like five hours a week, which is also some nonsense. Um, 
So after a while, he thought, well, this is, this is silly. I'm going to fix this problem. And because he was a technical guy, he wrote a script that connected to mint.com. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this site. Uh, basically, it lets you put in all your login information for your bank and your credit card and whatnot. And it takes all the transactions and downloads them and, and categorizes them for you automatically. And so because this company didn't have an expense account, he had to use his own credit card to do it. And he had a business card. Um, he was very easily to get. It was very easy for him to get all his reimbursable transactions. So then he had those auto formatted into the format that the reimbursement system needed. Uh, he had it emailed to him, and he made sure it was all right. And then he inserted it directly into the finance department's database through a security hole, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is unfortunate, but. Um, but it worked. And he'd been doing this for 10 some years, so he was able to do it safely. And he was reviewing every transaction, so he was able to make sure that it wasn't a problem. And what he found was that over time, he was saving about four hours and 55 minutes a week of, of time that otherwise he'd be doing basically data entry. And he was able to do the part of his job that he really liked, which was traveling around, working on innovation, and getting people to collaborate. So this is a big win, right? So the good news is that this is the kind of thing that we can all do these days. Whether you're a technical hacker or not, that there are loads of tools online. I mean, you've got Flickr for images, YouTube for video, Google Docs for pretty much everything. Strangely enough, this has not been latched onto yet by the corporate executives that are running our companies. Um, a recent poll showed that 20% uh, of a bunch of executives which were interviewed admitted that Google Docs was being widely used in their company. At the same time, 97% of them acknowledged that uh, Microsoft Office was installed on all of the workstations. This means that a quarter of all the executives interviewed in this study were paying close to $500 a year for every single computer in their organization while they knew full well that everyone was using a free alternative because it was better, which again, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the other big game changer that we're seeing is in the social power that we have now. Um, people that are on social networks all the time, and it gives us a, an access to a range of people and a range of possibilities that we never had before. Uh, Facebook, the average Facebook user has 120 friends and is a member of 12 groups. Um, a LinkedIn study recently showed that the more friends or the more connections you have on LinkedIn, the higher the possibility that you're going to have an, a higher than average income. So get started with LinkedIn tonight. Um, give you an example of this. One of the guys that we interviewed, Gary Keeling from Best Buy. Gary was a guy in the sales department there, and someone had called a committee together to figure out why the corporate policies were being ignored by the guys on the floor. And he said, well, you know, if the problem is that the people on the ground are, are not able to do what they need to do, why don't we set up a wiki and they can tell us about it, right? And the corporate executive says, well, yeah, no, no, we're not going to do that. So he thought about it. And that weekend, he decided, you know, I really believe in this idea. So he and another one of his coworkers spent 50 of their own dollars and set up a web page, a wiki, wiki site, which eventually became Blue Shirt Nation. And uh, blue shirts, all the people who actually worked in the stores wore blue shirts. And in a few months' time, three-fourths of the entire organization was on this website. And a few months later, the company was making a heck of a lot more money because all of those employees were making notes like uh, a compendium of common solutions to common customer complaints, um, a list of supply chain issues and how they could be solved. So now, Best Buy's competitor is actually out of business, and Best Buy has a new line of business consulting to other businesses about how to make their own blue shirt nation, right? So, this is, so that's the good news, which is that these employee-oriented changes are actually working. It turns out that those companies which make a big effort to support their employees in doing what they do best do better than those companies that don't. And we see this in a lot of examples. So for example, Google has a 20% time where all employees are supposed to spend 20% of their time working on whatever they want. And such minor projects as Gmail came out of this sort of an effort. The good news about all of this also is that it's not just in the company that we're starting to see this sort of a result. Uh, there's a website called kickstarter.com, which is um, it's a site where you can, anyone can go on and suggest a project that they'd like to do and say, look, this is the minimum amount of money that I need in order to get this thing off the ground. And then anyone in the world can go and kick in some cash. And if it hits that minimum amount, then the, they get the money and they get to go do the project and everyone's happy. 
um, this last summer, four college students decided that rather than get a summer job, they wanted to make an open source, privacy-oriented social software package. And they thought this was something that was really needed. Uh, they wanted to do, give it away for everybody for free. And they figured they needed $10,000 to pay their rent and get enough uh, top ramen or cheap food that they could make it through the summer. And after a couple of months of campaigning, they beat their $10,000 mark by a fair bit. They actually got $200,000. Um, that was donated because people really believed in what they were doing, which shows that if you follow your passion, increasingly, we have some means to actually get it executed. So let me bring it back uh, to, my, to this friend of mine. Um, after he developed the solution to the expensing system, he figured, well, hey, this is saving me five hours a week. That's a significant amount of money to my company. What, how much money could I save the company if everyone had this? So he made an estimation of that. And then he thought, well, how much more competitive would my company be if everyone could travel uh, and collaborate more? Which, again, you'll remember, was what he was hired for. Um, and then he thought, well, there's going to be some costs, so I'll have to do a, a project plan to make this enterprise ready. So there's you know, FAQs and documentation and stuff like that. So he calculated it up, and he realized he could save the company millions and millions of dollars. And he packaged this into a really nice presentation. And he asked for the executive team to have a meeting with him. And he went and sat down with him. And he walked him through the entire thing, showed him how much money they, he could save them, and they fired him. <laughs> Which brings me to my last point, that there, <laughs> that there are consequences. Um, but not in the way that you may be thinking. When I came and met my friend after he'd gotten fired, uh, three days later, I'd expected to meet him at the bar, buy him several beers, pat him on the back, and keep him from crying. But in fact, when I showed up, he was smiling ear to ear. And when I asked him why, he said, well, I, I'm glad I got out of the company when I did, because the company has no future. I, I gave him a golden opportunity on a silver platter, uh, a chance to innovate, be more competitive, and they told me to get out the door. And that's not the kind of company that I want to be at, and I'm glad I left when I did. And I think that this is something that's really critical, is that we're all now in a time when people are looking for more from their jobs than a paycheck. Um, a recent survey showed that six out of 10 employees think that a work-life balance is the most important thing in figuring out where and when they want to work, uh, pay being 10th on that list. Right now, most people will have an average of 10 jobs in their lifetime. Uh, and if you're uh, younger, in between 20 and 30, you're likely to change jobs every two years. And at that rate of change, if your company is not helping you learn, advance your career, and do something that means something to you, what's going to keep them from walking out the door? And when they do walk out the door, they'll walk out with everyone they've met and added to their social networks and everything that they've learned. So one last example of, of a, a, a very fine embodiment of this point. Um, one of the guys that we quote about in the book uh, is a young fellow who just recently got out of school and got a job with a yacht company. So his job, uh, he'd grown up around a marina and knew a lot about these boats, knew how these boats were made, and was really excited to be working there. But because he had no real world experience, they gave him a kind of a low, low grade job, and he ended up with a lot of extra time. So he did what every 20 something guy does when he's got a computer and an internet connection and some spare time. He hopped online, started poking around, and he found that there was a few news groups for customers, people who own these yachts, who weren't very happy about it. Uh, they were all trying to get customer support, but it turned out that this yacht company was not very good at doing that. Uh, and they insisted that people fill out a bunch of forms and you know, sit around on the phone on hold and whatnot. Um, so he decided that he would help them. All right, it seems natural enough. So he started suggesting solutions like, oh, if you've got this problem with your engine seizing up, you might want to try changing the oil. Or, oh, you've got peeling in this version of the yacht in terms of their cabin. Well, you, you, know, you should probably try this you know, iron-on stuff or whatever it is. And uh, you know, this is just what he did most of the time during the day because people really liked it and they really responded to it. And pretty soon, a lot of people were going to these news groups to get help because who wouldn't want an individual helping you with all your problems? So eventually, his boss got word of this, of the fact that all these customers were being really excited by what was going on. And so he called this guy into the office and said, this is, you know, this is very interesting what you're doing. Uh, have you cleared the, that you're doing all this with the sales department? And he said, no. You know. And have you cleared everything that you're saying on there with the marketing department? And he said, well, no. And so his boss said, well, you need to stop doing it or we're going to fire you, which sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're going to do? I mean, he's a 20-something guy. So he went back to the news groups. And uh, he said, look, you know, sorry, everyone. Can't do this anymore. Boss says no. Uh, good luck and goodbye. 
at which point something very interesting happened. Everyone on the news group who owned these yachts got together, they made an LLC, they made a small company, they elected this kid president, <laughs> then, <laughs> then they went back to the yacht company and said, you need to run all of your servicing through this company or we will boycott you and we will have all of our friends boycott you. And it turns out there are not so many people that own or buy yachts in the world that this is an insignificant threat, so that's exactly what they did. <laughs> and this kid went from working in the mailroom to being CEO of a very profitable company um, with obviously a pretty good fan base. So this is the sort of thing that we can see happen today. It's getting more common. So in closing, I wanted to, to bring it back just a moment to this uh, friend of mine with the reimbursing system. Because it turned out that after he'd had a few beers, he, he confessed that he was excited about more than just the fact that he'd managed to leave this company before he'd wasted a lot of time with it. Um, uh, one of the other uh, things that he was very pleased about is that three days after he'd gotten fired, he had four job offers on the table. And I asked him, you know, you've been fired, you're out of work for three, three you know, how do you get four job offers in three days? And he said, well, you know, as soon as I got fired, you know, I was in the elevator twittering about it. And then on the way back on the bus, I was posting on Facebook about it. And then when I got home, I blogged about it, right? So all of his peers, everyone in his network suddenly knew about what he had done. Two people had openings in their company and they immediately said, look, just call in, we'll interview you right now. You know, obviously you're innovative, you're, you're, you've got incentives, you, you try really hard, you do new things. This is the kind of thing that we need. And two other people had actually made entirely new jobs up just for him because they thought that what he was doing was so good. A few points after that, he confessed that there was one other little thing that he was kind of pleased about. You know the software package that he had written and, and built up for his company before they fired him? He sold it to their leading competitor. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is what we call an epic win. <laughs> so, in closing, I want to encourage you all to examine the systems that you're involved in now, the companies where you work, the organizations you're a part of, and consider breaking a few rules to make things better. Chances are good that you'll improve your life, your career, and possibly your company. Thanks very much.